we're going to continue in worship, um, in communal prayer. And so I will um, lead out, and then I will allow for pauses for you to join your prayers together with mine, and then I will prompt us, and we will say together, Lord, hear our prayer. So I invite you to bow your hearts and minds as we pray together. Jesus, we speak your name because you are our hope. You stepped into the darkness of our world and you brought the light of life. You entered into our reality to show us that nothing can divide us from your love. We speak your name and declare that you are our living hope. You gave your life and you defeated death and now we walk in the promise that your life is our life. And we have hope that your spirit is alive in us. Hope that you are working for good in the world. So this morning, we gather as your people to worship your name and to declare your hope. And now we pause to ponder the wonder of who you are and all you have done. together. Lord, hear our prayer. Jesus, we live amidst a world that often dangles things in our faces, offering us a version of hope that is hollow. And we admit that too often we put our hope in things that let us down. We put our hope in political systems. We put our hope in leaders. We put our hope in money and possessions and security we put our hope in our achievements and our status. We put our hope in relationships. And time and time again, we find these things cannot provide for us the ultimate hope that our souls long for. Help us to embrace the hope that you provide. The hope that is rooted in your love and your character. The hope that is steady and sure because you are steady and sure. So we pause now to consider the ways we have misplaced our hope and we open ourselves to the true hope that comes from you. Together, Lord, hear our prayer. God, we pray for those who are desperate for hope in this season. We pray for those around the world and those around our country who are displaced from their homes due to disaster or political unrest. We pray for peace and we pray for the restoration of homes. We pray for those who are facing difficult health conditions of all sorts. We pray for the healing of bodies, minds, and souls. We pray for those who are navigating tension in their relationships. We pray for wisdom and reconciliation. God, we believe that you want to bring healing and hope to those who are hurting. So we pause now to bring these people before you in prayer. Together, Lord, hear our prayer. 
God, as we enter the season of waiting, would you fill our hearts with anticipation? Help us to see the signs of your hope, your peace, your joy, and your love. Help us to see the ways that you are making things new. And as we make our way through Advent towards Christmas Day, would you increase our longing for your kingdom to come fully? And would you reveal to us the ways you are inviting us to join in and work together with you for the healing of our world? Help us to become people who embrace your hope and who walk in your hope and people who echo your hope to the world around us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite my friends, Kim, Aiden, and Janelyn, to join me on stage. Hi, friends. Come on in. Grab a seat. Every December, oh, you can just kind of line up. Yeah, that's, that's going to work. Thanks, Allison. Every December, we encourage our church community to respond to the prompts of, of Advent season with special generosity. And even though uh, there are many things that are very different about uh, this season from previous years, uh, we wanted to make giving a priority and maintain it as a fixture, something that should not be changed despite all the things we are facing. And part of this emphasis on giving is prioritizing generosity outwards as we give to global and local projects. And part of this emphasis is that we recognize the significant work that is happening as a result of your generous giving right here at Lakeview Church. So in the coming weeks, we will have guests from our ministry partners to share about the important global and local projects that your generosity is helping make possible. But today, I've invited Aiden, Janelyn, and Kim to share about some of the exciting work that is happening right here at Lakeview. So if you are unaware, Aiden is our young adults pastor, Janelyn is our youth pastor, and Kimberly is our kids pastor. Uh, so Aiden, let's start with you. Most people in our church don't really know much about our young adults community, so Tell us a little bit about the work you do. Yeah, well, I think some people might be finding out I'm the young adult pastor now for the first time. And they're like, oh, oh, I thought you were doing youth. Whoops. Um, uh, pretty much young adults, they are a group of young adults in our community. And especially over this last season with the pandemic, um, we have seen it as a church as more and more important to do things to engage the young adults in the life of our church that when they go through kids and youth, they're used to having programs for them that are ran, um, and they don't know what to do outside of a program. So then it comes to church, and they often just drop off in most churches because they don't have their own program, and that's how they've been taught to do church. So what I do is I run a program with the goal to get them out of the program. It's very, uh, <laughs> it's very effective. Our goal is to um, help them wrestle with God's story, but then also be engaged with the church. So they have an event where they come to and we gather and it's awesome, but then also um, we're trying to engage them in the life of Lakeview and being like, here's what it means to be an adult and like go to church and like have a small group and do those kinds of things. So that's what I spend a lot of my time focusing on. And we're grateful that you do that important work. And so in like, why do you feel like a young adults community in our church, like fostering that and nurturing that? Why is that especially important in these pandemic times? Um, well, I think, two things. I think the first thing is that in most churches, especially in Canada, again, like I said before, there's a drop off. They will go off, they'll go to college and they will just stop going to church either because they go to college and they start to have real like deep questions about faith that they weren't thinking about before that their professors are bringing up, but they don't have that community they had in youth anymore to talk about those questions. So they'll just either fall away from faith or they'll just slowly stop coming because they don't have a community pulling them in. But then also the second reason in the pandemic is I know that you don't like Zoom and you might think that because we're like young and hip that we love Zoom and sitting in front of a screen and pretending to talk to people. We do not. Um, especially if you do it for school and you do it like eight hours a day, that is not fun. 
Uh, so during COVID, especially in 2020, um, it was hard for young adults to have community, especially because most of their community, like they lost youth, so they didn't have that. And then they're going to a new school and it's all online, so they don't actually know anybody and they're not hanging out with anyone. And so there's this deep need, not only for Jesus with young adults, uh, but actually like a real in-person meaningful community. And so that's why we need it pretty desperately. I'm also 24, so I say we because I kind of am a young adult. So you're you're you are you, de- you are a you are a young uh, you're an adult, I guess. Um, so no, it's it's really uh, it's significant, honestly. And we're so glad that Aiden and his team are invested in this because we do care about engaging our young people. So now, Janelin, like junior high and senior high students, they've also had a difficult time navigating the pandemic in a similar way. School and all kinds of social things have been disrupted. So just tell us a little bit about what's happening with Lakeview Youth and why are you so committed to youth ministry? Yeah, a lot of what Aiden said is true. Like students, you know, everyone's on their phone all the time. So you figured like, oh, once we can't be in person, they'll be fine because they're on their phone all the time. And, And that wasn't the case. A lot of our students felt really lonely and specifically in the pandemic it was really hard for them like to maintain relationships not only with their friends at school but with their friends at youth and so we're really excited to be meeting back together in the building it's been really incredible we've actually joined junior high and senior high to be all together on one evening uh, partially to like help simplify schedules for families and whatnot but also to have senior high students be able to be leaders for junior high students in the way that they're serving at youth right now as part of our senior high serve program And we're also having junior high students who are now helping out in the kids' wing, helping out with the kids' programming and serving in that capacity. So not only are we teaching kids what it means to trust and follow Jesus together, we're also encouraging them that, like, this is their church, too. It's not just a place where we put them, you know, in a different room while while we as the adults worship at big church. It's like they are a part of our community, and they're contributing to it. And it's really exciting to watch them grow in that way. Yeah, and if you ever get the chance to just even like swing by the building on a Thursday night and just feel the energy of what's happening, it's incredible. And Janelyn, you've done such an amazing job navigating so many changes and challenges through the pandemic. I'm so proud of you. But also, I love the team you've engaged. I was, help, I was helping a kickoff just serving some meal. And I was just so pumped to see the team of leaders that were joined together. I love seeing people like Steve Coral and Matt Adrian, who we saw get baptized last week, and Gavin McMillan, and people who've grown up in our church or people who've been in our church for many, many years. It's exciting and it's significant. The community that's being fostered for our young people, it's, it's incredible. Well, and Janelyn talked about how, you know, there's also like a, a, an overlap being fostered between youth and kids, which is great. And so, you know, Kim, you're our newest member of our, of our pastoral team. Um, and you had a tall task of getting our kids ministry back and running after like really lying dormant for like a year. And like you came in and it was like task one, make Lakeview kids happen again. So just like tell us about, about like, how are things going down there in the kids wing on Sunday mornings? Well, we have lots of fun. We've got a whole bunch of different age groups, and we've got wonderful leaders that uh, show up every week or every other week, and they invest in the lives of these kids. And we are able to do things where we can be strategic in making sure that it's creative and uh, for their age group so that they can understand what they're doing. We know that the majority of people that decide to follow Jesus do so while they're children. So we need to do our very best to make sure we're serving those kids. Yeah, and I just, I love the, I love the vision that Kim has, is, is, is nurturing within Lake U Kids, which is working together to form the faith for our children. As a parent, I am so thankful of the work you do. But also, I must say, like, as the former youth pastor here, I'm thrilled at, like, this partnership that's been really fostered between kids and youth, where we're getting junior high students who are, like, actually getting involved, serving alongside our kids' leaders. And one fun thing that would happen was they helped pull off a, a pretty fun event a couple of weeks ago around Halloween. Can you tell us, Kim, about Trunk or Treat? So we had an event and our junior serve students, they ran all the carnival games, which was awesome. They did amazing. And it was great because we were able to bring in people that maybe weren't comfortable coming inside the building, but we were outside and we saw all sorts of people that we haven't seen for maybe a year and a half. And for some people, it was the very first time that they might have been here. And the other great thing is for a lot of people, if it was their very first time here, it was an easy thing to come in and see, hey, there's people here that love us. And we know that that community is so important, as both of these guys have already talked about. And when they make friends here at Lakeview, they have friends for life. So we're so excited about that. 
Yeah, and I must say, like, as one of the leaders here in the church, like, sometimes it can feel like church can be reduced down to, like, a message. We just put it online, and people can watch it. That's really all it comes down to. And the message is significant. But more important, I would say, is, is the relationships that are formed as that message really shapes our lives. And the thing that I love, Aiden, Jan, Lynn, and Kim, is the work that you do is bring our community together. You're forming significant relationships among our young people. I am so thankful for the work that you do. I am so grateful. And I just want to say again, a reminder to all of you, it is your generosity that makes it possible. One, for us to employ these amazing people and to allow us to offer these ministries that are truly making a difference in our young people. So I think that these two deserve a huge round of applause. Thank you, friends. Well, as, uh, as our pastors exit the stage, I'm actually going to invite a couple of guests to join me. Uh, these are my friends Derek and Ryan. Now, if you happen to pop into Lakeview Church sometime during the week, uh, I assure you that you are not going to know what you're going to find. Because if you show up, you might just happen upon a group of baton twirlers in the gym or hip-hop dancers. You might find corrections officers getting trained in self-defense or foster families visiting over coffee. You might find dog trainers, and you might even find skateboarders. So uh, this all happens at Lakeview because our facility, it is truly a gift to our broader community. And we are delighted in all the ways that it gets used throughout the week. And I've asked Derek and Ryan to come share about a skateboard ministry that you may not know are, we are helping make possible, and they're running it here. So, Derek, you guys, what are you guys doing in our building on Wednesday nights? Well, like Curtis said, we're skateboarders. So we are skateboarding in your gym. Um, you might have seen the big YFC trailer in the parking lot. Parked out there, that is actually full of skateboards. You guys live in that camper? Is yes. that what's happening? Is That's that... where Ryan and I live, actually, with Ryan's family and my family. It's quite tight. No, it's where, it's, it's where you guys store gear, right? All yes, the gear. that's where all our skate ramps are. So if that goes missing, that's all our ramps. <laughs> um, yeah, we run Skate Ministry. I work for Skate Life, which is a division of Young Life of Canada. Ryan works for Youth for Christ, running Antioch, which is his skateboard division of Youth for Christ. Um, every Wednesday night, we drag out the ramps. And then because our program is based around skateboarding, it's relatively easy to entertain youth and skaters, so we skate, and then we actually stop halfway through the night and we run something called highs and lows. Um, and that's just a time where we have a snack and we just share a high of the week and a low of the week. And what we've found in the skateboard community is a lot of guys use it, skateboarding as a way to escape life and hardships, but you can go to the park and not talk to anybody ever. Um, it can actually be kind of a lonely community if you're not one of like the regulars every week the skate park so we just stop we take a time to listen to each other um, and that's part of our strategy within skate life uh, is to actually earn the right to be able to speak into guys lives so we take the time to listen to them in hopes that they will take the time to listen to us and with that being able to share the gospel through it eventually through a relationship love it love it so good Derek and I have been friends for many many years I've actually just got to know Ryan over the past couple years so um, Ryan like why is this so important? You know, we, we are grateful that our space is being used. There's, there's one parent who was here who was just, like, amazed that we were, like, letting us, like, letting skateboards in the gym. I was like, man, like, a, we're going to get, get busted walls. We're going to get scratched on the floors. We know it. But, like, that's a gym. That's a church gym well used. But, like, why, Ryan, why is this so significant? Why, is the work, why do you believe in the work you guys are doing? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I kind of worry sometimes when I see people peering through the windows because what we're doing seems... Uh, dangerous and, and crazy, um, but it's, it's really, really important. There's actually been like scientific studies done on skateboarding in the last few years, and it, and it really helps these individuals, these young guys, like progress through trauma. There's something about the activity itself, the rolling, the, like you have to focus so much on what you're doing to make your, like to do the simplest of tricks in skateboarding. And so it's actually really healing. The, the, the activity itself is very, very healing. And then you bring in us as witnesses and Christians who believe in the gospel and like the power of the Holy Spirit to transform lives and like something happens. It's really so like, thank you, Curtis, and thank you, Lakeview Church, for allowing us to do crazy stuff in your gym. Um, 
because it's like there's nothing else like this in Saskatchewan. There are no indoor facilities in the wintertime. This is uh, an essential outlet for so many kids and, and young men and young women on the fringe of, of society, right? Like they, they don't have another outlet. Without it in the wintertime, like what's precarious in terms of their mental state and their, and their, their you know, well-being, without it, it, it's like, you know what I mean? They, they just don't have something good to do. And so we are able to offer that every Wednesday for a few hours, you know? So... And it's a crazy. I am like a like a like a sort of a poser skater. Like I'm not like a legit. These dudes can skateboard. I like hop on a skateboard, ride around. But I do take my kids to the skate park, and I've seen the guys from the skate park who are like for real walk into our church. I'm a little bit almost like starstruck because they're really good. Yeah. But I'm also amazed that they're stepping into our facility, and to the point where this past week I was leaving the office at five o'clock, and as I was leaving the office, I saw this person kind of like rolling down the road, and they made a turn down our parking lot, and I realized. This dude skateboard slash walked here yep. to come to skateboard on Wednesday nights to be with you guys a part of your community, which I think is incredible. And now, Ryan, you're also like, you're, you're based in Warman, is that yes, right? And so correct. you're actually working towards some stuff in the yep. Warman area. So if, if for those of you who are part of the Warman, Martinsville community, make sure you touch base with Ryan afterwards. He's got some exciting things happening in those communities and especially like trying to work through skateboard to make a difference in young people's lives. So yes. I just want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to our space. I love seeing you in there, and I love that you came to share as well. And again, uh, you as a community, we make this possible. Because this facility exists and because we hold it loosely with generosity, this kind of incredible work is made possible. So can you please give these two a round of applause. Thank them so much. Thank you, guys. So here are, uh, is a summary of our giving projects for this year. And we're going to tell these stories more over the coming weeks. But as we've done in recent years, we've really put forward a, a bold ask to our church. And we do this with faith because we have faith in God. And we do this because we believe in the generosity of our community. So this year we are seeking to raise, as you can see, $40,000 for our global work that we do with Hands at Work in Africa. We are also seeking to raise $10,000 to support the work that Sons and Daughters does locally with families at risk, especially with foster families. We've added MCC Saskatchewan this year as a ministry partner, and we're going to hear from uh, Randy Clausen next week in the work that he's doing with Truth and Reconciliation and Indigenous Neighbors. And then finally, this is also a time where our, just our general operating needs are significant in December. And so we've set for the goal $300,000. And that giving is what makes all that we heard today possible. It's what makes our gatherings possible. It is really what provides the heartbeat of the life of our church. And so we invite you to give and give generously in this season. So the ways you can give are consistent. If you're new to our community, you need to be aware, though, you can give online at lakeviewchurch.com slash give. You can text 84321, follow the prompts to give. We have give boxes that are by the exits, or you can give at the info desk with cash or check. And we appreciate your giving, and we invite you to give generously this season. A couple more announcements before Allison comes to bring us uh, the message for the morning. Uh, we are in that season where we are making our way through Advent, which means we are anticipating as a church community gathering together in person for Christmas Eve. I know we really enjoyed the difference of last year, but we're already back together, aren't we? Nancy, are you excited to come together in person? I'm excited. So this year, Christmas Eve, we are planning to host three services, 3 o'clock, 4.30, and 6 o'clock p.m. This week, you will be able to register online. And the reason we're going to ask you to register is because we do want to maintain some sense of capacity on our gatherings. So uh, for those of you who are still feeling unsure about gathering in large, in large crowds, our 3 o'clock service will be capped at 150 people. The 4.30 and 6 o'clock services will be capped at 350, so 50% 50 capacity. And if we get to the point where our services are over full, we will open up a 1.30 service if necessary. Now, one thing I just want to say to those of you who are gathered here especially is normally Christmas time is a time where we think about our neighbors and we think about who's in my world that I can invite to come to church on Christmas Eve. And I think that is a wonderful um, motivation we should still pay attention to. But I actually want to just encourage those of us who are here today to consider who used to be with us on Sundays that you haven't seen for a while 
that you can use this opportunity to invite to come back and join us. I think we're all feeling this sense as the pandemic endures that yes, we are one community, but we miss seeing one another. We miss gathering. And I think that those of us who have come have found we can do this. There's, there's space. There's, uh, there's controls in place to ensure that we are being wise and we're following the right restrictions. But it is also so good for us to gather. And so this is a special invitation for those of us who have been gathering regularly on Sundays. And you know, if you've been paying attention, we're a consistent group for the most part. Let's consider those who are a part of our broader Lakeview Church community, and let's consider maybe making a special ask for them to come and join us at Christmas Eve this year. Last announcement I have is just if you are new and you're uh, looking to get involved in anything happening in our church, you can go to lakeviewchurch.com slash connect, and there's a form you can fill out that lets, you know, let us, let us know how you'd like to get involved, because we would love to help you find your way more into the heart of our church community. Good morning, Lakeview, and welcome to our first uh, Sunday in our Advent series. We're going to head into a series entitled Reunion, and it's all about the themes of Advent, hope, peace, joy, and love. Um, And we're going to mark this season not by celebrating Christmas, but by celebrating Advent. And so before we begin, I want to give you a quick lesson on Advent and on the Advent wreath, which we're going to light every week, like Kurt talked about at the beginning of the service. Um, So traditionally, the Advent season is a season of preparation and waiting it actually doesn't look like Christmas. In fact, in some traditions, Advent actually feels a lot like Lent. It's a time of repentance and fasting while the church makes room and prepares for the coming of Jesus. Christmas time, the time of celebration, actually doesn't start until Christmas Day. And that's when these traditions put up their trees and start the party. That's where the 12 days of Christmas come from, if you're wondering. And Advent is marked by reflection, it's marked by quiet, it's marked by waiting. The Advent season is awaiting the arrival of Jesus, not just on the calendar on December 25th, but also awaiting Jesus' arrival in our hearts and in our lives and in the future. It is a season where we make preparations, where we make room for Jesus. And a relatively recent addition to the season of Advent, most likely started in the 19th century, was the Advent wreath. That's the wreath where we lit the candle this morning. And a new candle is lit each of the four Sundays leading up to Advent, representing different things depending on the tradition. So the candles we're lighting are going to represent hope for today, peace, joy, and love. And then there's a Christ candle in the middle, which is lit on Christmas Day, or we're going to light it on Christmas Eve as a community. Now, often uh, the three candles, uh, peace, hope, and love, are purple because purple is the color of repentance in the liturgical church. But then we also have the pink candle, joy, and that's a little bit different because that's the week of joy. Maybe we don't want you know, the color of repentance. Also, it happens on week three, which means that we're over halfway through the time of waiting. We're almost at the time of feasting and celebration. So that candle's a little different. So there's your little lesson on Advent and the Advent wreath. And this week, our first candle is lit, the hope candle. And the more that we learn about Advent, the more we realize that the hope to which Advent points is not the hope that our culture is throwing at us these days. It's not hallmark hope, where everything is wrapped up and happy by Christmas Day. You found your true love. You're getting along with your parents. Everyone's all warm and cozy in one house. It is a hope that sees and leans into the dark. And it is the dark into which the light of hope shines. Listen to these words from Isaiah 9-2, part of our Advent readings this week. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. 
For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. So these words were written to the people of Israel when they were living in a time of deep, deep darkness. In fact, chapter 8, the verses just before these ones, um, contain an oracle in which God says that the people of Israel will be overtaken by Assyria as a consequence for defying God's laws. But then, unexpectedly, in chapter 9, Isaiah says that this new potential, this new future, is possible even in the midst of the darkness, and it will come through the birth of a baby boy. In the immediate context of Isaiah, the birth of this baby is actually King Hezekiah, who comes along and leads the people into some, you know, relatively good times in that time of history in Israel. But later, as we look back on this passage, we also see echoes of the baby Jesus, who brings new light, life, and hope into the world. And we also are people who walk in darkness. In fact, Advent starts in the dark. We live in a province where we start putting our sweaters on in the evening in August. When September hits, we've hit the autumn solstice. And these days, the sun sets at 5 p.m. and rises at 9 a.m. That's nearly 16 hours of darkness. And we haven't even hit the shortest day of the year yet. Advent literally starts in the dark. And this literal darkness of creation invites us also to consider where darkness is in our world and in our lives. Fleming Rutledge says this, Advent is a time for taking fearless inventory of the darkness. Now, most of us have been conditioned to believe that the days leading up to Christmas should be merry and bright. Sparkling snow, cocoa in front of the Christmas lights, matching PJs, party dresses. It's celebration. It's light and brightness. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with celebration. Nothing wrong with enjoying the season. But that is not Advent. Advent, the season that the church celebrates, is not the season that Hallmark and Costco celebrate. It is about quiet. It is about waiting. It is about preparation. It is about recognizing the darkness of this season and also facing into the metaphorical and real darkness that surrounds us in our worlds and in our lives. Some of us are really aware of how this merry and bright season exposes the ways that we are neither merry nor bright. Maybe you used to be, but then life happened. You know, a parent died, or your kids grew up and left, or some kind of loss or disappointment hit. And now we think that this season is only for those who are happy and put together not Advent. Advent is actually for those who walk in darkness. And darkness is actually the place where light, where hope shines. So when my kids were little, we would sometimes play kick the can on our acreage. So if you haven't played kick the can, here are the basic rules. Um, One person guards a tin can in the middle of the yard, That was always me. And everyone else disperses while the guard covers their eyes. And then after the guard is done counting, the goal is that those who have hidden will come and kick the can before the guard tags them or says their name. Now, when we used to play this in the daytime, I ended up being the perpetual guard because my kids were smarter than I was and faster than I was, and they would always let one another out of the jail, and I would just always be the guard. But when we played at night, I could crush them because I had a ploy that helped me win, a never-ending supply of glow sticks. My kids loved glow sticks. 
So I would just crack one of those babies for each of them, give it to them, and send them out to hide. And then all I had to do was stand by the can and wait for a disembodied glow stick to pop out from behind a shrub or a tree or start crawling along the ground. I could just sit quietly in the dark and I could see them coming. I just had to wait for the light to appear. What if the darkness helps us see where God, where hope, is hidden? What if our own darkness, and even the darkness of the world, helps us see more clearly the things we couldn't see when it was light and bright? The lightness and brightness of this season can actually distract us from where hope is found. The lights of Best Buy and Costco and Toys R Us invite us to fill our longings with new purchases, to distract ourselves from the loneliness and difficulties of our lives with another new gadget. But Advent invites us to turn off the distraction of those lights and see where real hope might be found. And so if you found yourself in the dark, by circumstances this year, that's good news. You're a step ahead. You're pre-prepped for Advent. You're ready to search for those glow sticks in the yard. So what if, just for a moment, instead of avoiding the dark during this season, instead of sidelining ourselves because we aren't merry and bright, we sat in the dark in order to clear a little space in our lives, in our hearts, and in our minds to consider the ways that darkness does exist in our world, to consider the ways that injustice exists, to think about the sources of despair in our lives and in the lives around us, and to let our eyes adjust to where light shines in the middle of the darkness because Advent comes in the darkness. But Advent also comes in waiting. So one of the origin stories of the Advent wreath is that a Lutheran minister who worked with uh, children at a mission grew really tired of the children asking him when Christmas was gonna come. I'm sure we can all relate to that if we have children. And so he took a wagon wheel and he put four big red candles on it and lit one each Sunday leading up to Christmas, and then he had six white candles in between, and every day he would light a candle, and it was meant to teach the children to learn to wait. Advent is about waiting. It is a season that reminds us that waiting is a part of life. Waiting is a part of formation, and that we need to learn to wait with patience. So when those little kids of mine dispersed into the darkness to hide and then try to sneak up on me, my secret weapon wasn't just the glow sticks, it was my ability to wait. As I sat there and stayed attentive to the moment, I knew the kids would reveal themselves eventually. And in the in-between time, I had to practice patience. I could chase them, I could go out and try to find them, but the way that I actually won the game was by being patient. The singular mark of patience is not endurance or fortitude, but hope. To be impatient is to live without hope. So patience is allowing each moment to be filled to the brim with whatever that moment has to offer. Instead of trying to force some future to happen right now, hope is living with the trust that each moment reveals what is needed in order to meet the future that we hope for. So impatience is trying to force the future into the present. So impatience would be me going and trying to find the kids on 80 acres of land. They didn't get to go in all 80 acres, but you know, they could wander potentially in 80 acres of land, and then I likely would have missed them in the process. Patience is allowing each moment to be formed by hope. Patience is staying with, with what is, knowing that what we hope for is going to come. We don't have to control it or make it happen. We can wait. 
And this is the kind of hope that is central to waiting during Advent. We do not need to ensure or secure a future. We know that right in the middle of a dark world, the light came on that first Christmas, and it continues to do so in our world. Just like in Isaiah, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Listen to what John says in John 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was God and was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. And God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Advent invites us to remember that first arrival of Jesus. The light shone in the darkness, but also to pay attention to the ways that Jesus is still arriving in the midst of the darkness, incognito, just like he did that first time, like a little kid wiggling through the grass with his glow stick, or like a baby boy wrapped up like a burrito in a manger. We don't need to make it happen, but we do need to stay patient. We need to pay attention. So what if, for a moment, we lit our candles, not just to consider the darkness, but to train our hearts and our minds and our bodies to wait? to train ourselves to practice patience, to wait for the light to come in the midst of darkness. As we wait in the dark, though, the hope that grows in us also leads us to action. We wait for Jesus to come, but in the meantime, we are also compelled to become reflections of that light. We are invited in our waiting to reveal the hope by which we live in the way that we posture ourselves and in the way that we live in the world. So sometimes on the way home from work, I'll stop at the local grocery store. It's usually 4.30 or 5 o'clock. And seeing as I live by myself most of the time now, all I need is a loaf of bread and cream for my coffee. And I'm hoping to be in and out of there in five minutes. But when I get my stuff and I go to the checkout line, you guys have been here, there are only two checkout lines open and there are about 50 people with two things that they have in their hands because they want to be home in five minutes, right? And we're frustrated because we're not going to make it out of the store in five minutes and to our cozy homes ASAP like we hoped. We're going to have to wait. Now what if in our waiting, We forgot our destination. We forgot what we were waiting for, what the goal of our waiting was. What if we started wandering out of the lines and through the store, grabbing groceries and a perpetual shopping game? What if we forgot the goal? It would be mayhem. It would be like shopping purgatory. But of course, we don't do that. We all know where we're headed. We're headed home. And what the goal is, the goal is to wait in line and be polite and take our turn and get out of the store as quickly as possible. Our hope for our future determines how we act in the present. And hope in the Christian life also means that we wait in a certain way. We act in a certain way. Romans 13 says this, The night is about over. Dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God is doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work he began when we first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute. We must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence and sleeping around and dissipation and bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Get out of bed and get dressed. Don't don't loiter and linger, waiting until the very last minute. Dress yourselves in Christ and be up and about. While Advent starts in the dark, it doesn't end in the dark. In fact, when Advent ends, we've passed the darkest day of the year. Advent reminds us that the light is coming. 
It reminds us that the dawn is about to break and it ends with the arrival of the light of the world. Although the world looks and feels dark, and although sometimes we feel like we're stuck in this perpetual waiting game, our Christian hope is that things will be made new. Creation will be healed, justice will come, peace will rule, and love will win. And in the meantime, we are called to live as though the dawn is about to break, to keep living into this future, revealing the source of our hope in the here and now. In this season, the church celebrates two things. God has already acted definitively on our behalf, and God will act definitively in the future to bring his purposes to pass once and for all. This is what it means to watch and wait for the second advent of Christ, no matter how long it takes. And this gives us confidence and boldness to do things that might seem very small, but nevertheless have their place in the greater cause. We light the candle of hope at the beginning of Advent, remembering that Advent starts in the dark. We light the candle of hope as a sign of our patient waiting. We know the hope that will come, and we do not need to control it or make it happen. We can wait. But we light the candle also to remind ourselves that we are invited to live a future in the present. We are called to reflect the light, to be agents of hope in the world. And so this season... You are invited to take a break from the bright lights and to enter the darkness and wait, hopefully, for the light. Mm -hmm.